If they wrote today, would we listen? If they wrote today, would we listen? I want to put a thought into your mind. You and I have never experienced this. Not in real time, not, not in our lives, but just think about this for a minute. At a certain point in time, when people read the letters of this book, it was live. You think about Matthew, Mark, and John. People read these as these things had just happened. You, you look at the book of Acts and you see the beginning of the church and, and people read this and they knew all these things that took place and, and it was in their lifetimes. And then you get to the book of Romans and and you go from that point forward and you start seeing letters written to people that were just like us and, and just imagine being a part of the church at Rome and, and they read this letter and it was real time. You go over the Corinthian letter as you keep going through the New Testament and, and they get a first one and then they get a second one. Then, then the people at Galatian, the people at Ephesus, and, and you march all the way down through to that final book, the book of Revelation, and, and they read these letters I mean in real time. So think about this. If they wrote today, would we listen? I, I, I don't know what our mindset would be. I, I don't know what we would think if we received a letter the, to the churches of Pulaski or the churches of Tennessee or the churches of America. What if it was the Acts of America. What would they write to us and, and what would they tell us and, and, and would it be like some of the other letters? You know, the book of Romans. Oh, what an opening book. This group of people who follow Christ wanted this group of people to get in trouble and this group of people that follow Christ wanted this group of people to get in trouble and it's almost as if it starts out, yeah, get them, yeah, get them, and then it turns on them. Would that be us? Then you read First and Second Corinthians, and, and you realize, boy, their lives were wreck. <laughs> kind of makes you feel at home, doesn't it? A lot of problems there. And you read all these other letters, and you just wonder, if they wrote today, what, would, would we really listen? Well, I sat down with this thought and came up with four areas I want us to look at for just a few moments of our time. Number one, if they wrote today, would we really listen about sin. By the way, go read Romans. It's about sin. Go read First and Second Corinthians. Guess what it's about? There's, there's segments on sin. Go read all these letters written to churches and written to people and written to individuals. And guess what? Sin's in there somewhere. Would we listen if a letter was written to us today about sin? Would we listen if there was a letter written to us and it talked about our relationships We'll talk about more about what we mean in that particular segment because we're going to look at a segment that we've looked at before and, and I want us to ask a very interesting question and, and then we're going to make an offshoot to other relationships that exist because, well, there are a lot of relationships that are discussed inside the New Testament. Then we're going to ask this question. If they wrote to us today and they wrote about time, would we listen you know, your mind is probably going to the thought of Jesus returning, and that is very true, but here's the thought on that. We don't know what time that's going to be. But there were things that were written about when it was, it was real time. I mean, it was in their lifetime. Would we listen like they did about time? Then finally, if they wrote today, would we listen to what they wrote about an opportunity? And that's where we're going to go to where our reading was just a moment ago, to where Jesus was on his way to the place that's called of a skull. And we're going to look at a man who was convinced, was encouraged to, to carry a load for someone else. And let's ask this question. If they wrote about opportunity, would we take the time would we really be concerned about it? Let's talk about sin for just a moment. That seems like an appropriate place to start, isn't it? So go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul starts out 1 Corinthians and he starts out right off the bat. He says, I am Paul. I am an apostle to Jesus Christ. And he really gets in there and gets going. And if you read that entire letter and couple it with 2 Corinthians, wow, lots going on there. 
But you know, that's not much different than what's going on in our culture, in our society, in our time. There are a lot of problems in culture and society and time, and from time to time, those problems enter the church. So if, if they wrote us a letter... And they wrote about sin. Would we listen? Well, we can go to a time where Paul did write about sin, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. And he says this inside of verse 1. It is reported commonly. Stop there. You know what that means? It's not even a question. Don't even have to go, well, that might not be what that means. We can look at this statement. It is reported commonly among you. We can look at this phrase and know... Nobody questioned whether the church at Corinth was involved in sinful practices or sin was in their midst. So he writes this. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles. You know, here's the reality. It didn't have to be fornication. Just read, read the verse this way. It is reported commonly that there is sin among you. 1 Corinthians 5, and this concept of withdrawal of fellowship, encouraging people to repent, is not a concept that's solely locked into a sexual sin. Now, in this particular case, the individual who was involved in this was involved in, and look at what Paul does. He just tells it like it is. This individual was involved in a relationship problem, and he lines it out. We know what this problem is. We know, by the way... This is, this is a question for our current culture. Is this a problem of today, this particular sin? Oh, yeah. Right, now, let me ask you a, a little deeper question, a little, little, little bit more difficult question. Is this ever a problem among the church? We don't want to answer that one as quick as we did the other one. But we know the answer. Let me ask you this. Is sin ever in the church? The answer is yes. So if, if, if he wrote to them... And, and he really just got down in it. And, and he says, verse 2, you're puffed up. Would he write that to us? You, you've not mourned. Would he, would, would, he, would he write that to us? You, you've not tried to help him get out of this, to get it among from you, verse 2. Would, would he write that to us? I don't know the answer to that question. I can't answer that question to you, but here's what I know. When he wrote to these people, they were just like us. They lived and breathed on the face of this earth. They were created in the image of God. They were people who called themselves Christians. And among them was sin. Would we listen? If they wrote to us about sin. Matter of fact, it doesn't take you very long. Inside of the book of 1 Corinthians, you move into chapter 6. You look at verse 11 and you read these words. And such were some of you. All right, I'm going to give you the answer to the question I'm getting ready to ask. Yes. I'm going to give you the answer to the follow-up question that I'm going to ask. Yes. Now, here's the question. And such were some of you. Was that also us? Yes. You read on inside of this particular scene. Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Was that also us? Yes. By the way, that was the whole mission of what Jesus came to do, isn't it? Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So if they wrote to us today and they wrote about sin, and I'm not just talking about one sin in particular, because 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, right there before verse 11, oh, he lists a string of them. If they wrote to us about sin, let me ask you this question. Would we listen? Now, when we get to the end of our lesson, we're going to draw all this into conclusion. Number two, if, if they wrote to us today about relationships, would we listen? Go with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Lots going on in the book of Ephesians. Matter of fact, it's a very positive book. And, and we've looked at Ephesians 5 a number of times because it illustrates something to us that's important. I think we all will agree tonight that marriage is sacred. And it must be kept that way. But at the same time, we must also agree that the church is sacred. And it must be kept that way. 
Because this great illustration is happening between marriage on one side and the church on another. Now you think about this. If he's using the husband and wife relationship to illustrate how important the church is, I want you to think about it in the reverse. He's using the the, the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, and illustrating that backwards toward marriage. So let me ask you this. How important are relationships? Well, Jesus used the church and himself as the glaring representation of it. How important is it? It's at the top of the list. And he, he talks about marriage here. I specifically want you to see verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Let me ask you a question. Does the Lord take care of the church? He, he's in the taking care of church business, isn't he, by the way? He feeds us with his word. That's why in John 14, verse 26, he said, I'm going to send the comforter, and he's going to remind you of all things I have said, and that's what you're going to distribute through the earth. We're still recipients of that comforter today. By the way, think about that word comforter. It's supposed to give you comfort. God's word, though it can cut, God's word, though it can hurt, God's word, though it can be harsh at times because of our living, what's it supposed to do? To comfort. That's its main goal. God is in the taking care of the church business. Number two, not only does he send his word, number two, he's coming back. By the way, Men, when you got married, did you come back? You, you didn't leave her alone, did you? You, you? you came back. Do you get what's happening here? Christ, who gave himself for the church, Christ, who, who gave his blood for the church, he, he's not going to leave the church alone. He's coming back. That, that's an illustration we learned from marriage, Ephesians 5. He's taking care of the church. Not only that, how does God take care of the church in its organization structure? You go read 1 Timothy, you'll eventually come to a section where Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him to go throughout the churches and establish elders. And there's a list of qualifications there. Why did God give those qualifications? They're not suggestions, by the way. They're qualifications that must be met. And by the way, how many do we have to meet? Just a few of them. Or all of them. It's all of them. How do you know God's taking care of the church? Because he not only established his word, he's not only coming back, but he placed men in this earth who love his word to take care of the church. Boy, that's important. You want to know how you know that Christ loves the church? Go ye into all the world. He has given the church the ability to sustain growth. He's not going to let it die. So Jesus and his bride, the husband and the wife, how important now is it for relationships to be on our mind? Oh, at the top of the list. So let me ask you a question. I want you to look at Ephesians 5, and I want you to look at verse 29, and I want, to, I, I want husbands to answer this. I want wives to answer this. I want future husbands to answer this. I want future wives to answer this. Do you love yourself? Not the question you thought I was going to ask, huh? Do you love yourself? For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Boy, we take care of ourselves, don't we? We know how to do that in many ways. And we know how to express what we need in this life. We know how to do that. Now think about this. Even as the Lord, the church. Men, do you know what your wife needs? Wives, do you know what your men need? If you're thinking about getting married, do you know what marriage is about? Do you know what is going to be required of you? That's that's a big question right there. Because marriage isn't it so much more than I love you. Boy, wouldn't that be easy? You remember the man who got married? Told his wife he loved her on the wedding day. Said, if it changes, I'll let you know. Never told her again. Pretty miserable, huh? It's so much more than that. But no man has ever hated himself. 
The illustration is we, we take care of ourselves. We know what we need. We know what we want. We know what we desire, and we go after those things. What do we do about the church? Because Christ has done it for the church. What do we do for our spouses? Relationships are important. Now you move into Ephesians chapter 6. Look at the first word. Ephesians 6 verse 1. Children. I'm going to make a statement real quick. It has nothing to do with husband-wife relationships and parent-children relationships in this room, but it has everything to do with community relationships. All right, you got a challenge on your hands tonight because when you go and get in your car tonight at this building, you're going to meet somebody you've never met before because they are tricking and treating everywhere they can and parking everywhere else they can. What kind of relationship can you build? Just a thought. Just a thought. Will we reach out to others? I hope they're still out there when we leave. I won't preach that long. Will we build relationships? Ephesians 6, 1. Let's get back to that. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Okay, do, do you see that what's happening here? Christ and the church, the husband and the wife, parents and children. You know what Jesus is saying? Relationships are really important. And if they were to write a letter to us today, and they wrote about relationships, by the way, you can keep on going inside of chapter 6, and you can read about relationships. Verse 6, don't serve your masters as those who just uh, serve them as I service. When you boss, I know there's a deeper context of this verse, but, but, but at work, do you only work when they're looking, or do you work when nobody's looking? That's the idea here. Relationships are important. So in this, would we really listen if they wrote about relationships? Here's number three. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If they were to write today, and they were to write about time, would we listen? Well, Jesus in Matthew 7, or Matthew 4, verse 17, he talks about time. Listen to this. From that time time Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that's all about time folks a lot of our lives revolve around time management now many times we're poor at it you ever been double booked triple booked got to be here got to be there Matter of fact, I was laughing at somebody earlier today. Didn't know which kid to get to which school. Boy, doesn't that happen? Sometimes we're just so busy. But this is about time. This is not about the physical elements of this life, even though they're important. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, you and I know, as we look at this, we can see what Jesus was describing He's saying the church is almost here. And matter of fact, you read the rest of Matthew out and you go into the book of Acts, the church arrives. It's established. Jesus is talking about time. So if they wrote today about time, what would they say? Well, I don't know what they would write about because the church has already been established. That's not going to change. I know we can talk about the time when Jesus is going to come back, and, and that's already been written about, so that's not going to change. But I want you to think about this. Would we take time seriously? In fact, this is not the only time, first time, second time, third time, fourth time. There's a lot about time. Matter of fact, in the very beginning, how many days did it take God to create this world that we know? you got to add that seventh one, the day he rested. You know what that says about time? If God can do that in six days and take a day to rest, we have more than enough time to not say, I'm just too busy. We use that excuse sometimes. Time management back. So this idea, he, he's saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, go back up to verse 12. I want you to see something in Matthew 4, verse 12. Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John... Pause. John was the forerunner of Christ. John was the one that said, there's one coming whose shoes I'm not worthy to fill. John was the one who said that the Christ was coming, and that was all true. But look at what happens to John. 
Now when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. That might be the time when some people say, whoop, I'm done. I'm not going to prison for this. I hope we never get to that point, but let me ask you this. Is your faith strong enough to stand the test of time? It's just something to think about. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time, what time? When John was now in prison. Boy, that makes us think about our time. Which brings us to our last thought. If they were to write today, would we think about opportunity? It's in Matthew 27, 32. That as Jesus was carrying the cross... They found a man, of Cyrene specifically. His name was Simon. I love this, Simon by name, just to get specific with it. And they compelled him to bear his cross. Go read the previous time before Matthew 27, 32. And I, I don't know how Jesus got as far as he did physically, but he did. He had been beaten well to the point of death. He was hurting well to the point past pain. And yet, there was a man who saw all this happening. And he was compelled to bear the cross of Christ. When you see people suffering, what are you going to do about it? More importantly, I want to ask a hypothetical question. Would you carry the cross of Jesus? Would you carry the cross of Jesus? By the way, Simon would have known when we get where we're going, he's dead. What a weight to bear. What a weight to bear. But I want you to think about this in a more intimate way in our lives because we're, we're not going to carry the cross of Jesus. That's already taken place. I want you to go, go to Galatians 6. And this is where we'll end for the night, especially in this point. Then we'll make it all pull together. We'll make it all pull together with one phrase. We're going to pull all this together. In Galatians 6, I want you to look at the first word of Galatians 6 1. Brethren. Now, I'm not a scholar, but I won't tell you what Jonathan thinks for just a minute. That might be the most important biblical word you will ever read. Brethren. Boy, that indicates something. That's not just talking about the world. That's not talking about a nationality of people, a, a group of people, a, a segment of society. Boy, that's talking about something deep right there. Brethren, in that particular concept. That's us. You ever thought about that? Every time you read that word, that's us. And look at what he says, brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, thou shalt also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You're never going to carry the cross of Jesus. But I know what we can do. We can bear burdens. Now, does that concept seem a little unfamiliar to us? Let me give you the answer. The answer is yes. I'm going to use a phrase about our hands, and I, I mean it toward Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Sometimes we just don't want to get our hands dirty. Get it? Sometimes we don't want to get our hands dirty. I'm going to use a reference that we usually use with time. I don't have time for that today. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. This may be an unfamiliar concept to us, but at the same time, it should be a very familiar concept to us because... We've done this, and sometimes we just don't realize what that is. 
You, you know, when someone repents or when someone comes forward to be baptized and, and, and after that is over and after the service has ended, I've always done something and I've tried to hide that I do it. I'll tell you about it now. I've always stood back and just watched. Every time. Because something happens in that moment and we just don't get it. We start bearing burdens. We start getting our hands dirty. We realize, boy, we've got all the time that we need. We realize, I, I, I know what this is. I, I can do that. And, and sometimes I like to just listen to what people say in moments like that. And the truth is we know how to bear one another's burdens. We may not always know the opportunity, but we know how to do it. So if they wrote to us about opportunity, would we really listen? So let's boil all this together in one statement. It's going to be a really easy statement. If Paul or Peter or, or Luke were to write a letter to us today, I know that's hypothetical. I know that's not happening. I know God's word is complete. I, I'm there. I'm just asking you to think. If they were to write a letter to us today, would we listen? Here's my response. Let's pull it all together. About sin, about relationships, about time, about opportunity. If they wrote us a letter about any of those things or anything else, would we listen? Here's how we pull it all together. They already have. Maybe the most appropriate question we should ask is not if they wrote one, would we listen? Maybe the question we should ask is, hey, they wrote one, have we read it? Get it? It's already here. I don't have to be hypothetical. I, I, I like the thought. If they wrote what I listen, I like the thought. Something about destroying your own sermon at the end so it seems un, uh, inappropriate, but it, but it really makes the point, doesn't it? They already have. It's just right here. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to just listen. To just read. To just Because they already have. Isn't it comforting to know that we don't have to wait for another letter? I don't have to wait for some information that I don't have. I have everything I need to know. What I must do to be saved. How I can stay saved. And what I can do to bring others to Christ. Isn't that good to know? That he takes care of us. Maybe tonight you recognize that you need to become a Christian if you need to become a Christian this evening, it would be the greatest honor. It would be the greatest privilege for the people here to help bear your burdens, help you in that. Maybe that's you tonight. You can let that be known as we sing the song in just a moment. Maybe you're here and there's something in your life. Maybe there's sin. You know, they wrote about sin. Maybe there's doubt. You know, the Bible talks about doubt. Maybe there are other problems that just have you burdened down. You know, the, the Bible talks about that. Isn't it good to know we can bring those things to the Lord? And He's there for us. Is that you tonight? Caleb has picked out a song for us to sing. Let's think about our souls. Let's think about eternity. Let's think about what they already wrote. And let's respond accordingly. Let's stand and sing.